Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask you to look with mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and to be given over to the hands of sinners and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord says, my servant will succeed in his task. He will be highly honored. Many people were shocked when they saw him. He was so disfigured that he hardly looked human. But now many nations will marvel at him, and the kings will be speechless with amazement. They will see and understand something they have never known. The people reply, who would have believed what we now report? Who could have seen the Lord's hand in this? It was the will of God that his servant grow like a plant taking root in dry ground. He had no dignity or beauty to make us take notice of him. There was nothing to him. We despised him and rejected him. He endured suffering and pain. No one would even look at him. We ignored him as if he were nothing. But he endured the suffering that should have been ours, the pain that we should have borne. All the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by God. But because of our sins he was wounded, beaten because of the evil we did. We are healed by the punishment he suffered made whole by the blows he received. He was treated harshly, but endured it humbly. He never said a word. Like a lamb about to be slaughtered, like a sheep about to be sheared, he never said a word. He was arrested and sentenced and led off to die, and no one cared about his fate. He was put to death for the sins of our people. He was placed in a grave with evil men. He was buried with the rich, even though he had never committed a crime or ever told a lie. The Lord says, It was my will that he should suffer. His death was a sacrifice to bring forgiveness. And so he will see his descendants. He will live a long life, and through him my purpose will succeed. After a life of suffering, he will again have joy. He will know that he did not suffer in vain. My devoted servant, with whom I am pleased, will bear the punishment of many, and for his sake, I will forgive them. And so I will give him a place of honor, a place among great and powerful men. He willingly gave his life and shared the fate of evil men. He took the place of many sinners. And prayed that they might be forgiven. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. After Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, whom are you looking for? And they answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, Whom are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you're looking for me, let those men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of them, of those who you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. They took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? 
disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation did you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews replied, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted and replied, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. 
Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gavatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it. See who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, 
here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there, so they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. For me, kind Jesus, was thine incarnation. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In his final hours, Jesus seems so very isolated, a most solitary man, separated from the community of those he loves. We see him praying alone in the Garden of Gethsemane. His closest friends can't even stay awake to watch with him. Jesus is arrested and put on trial alone before the high priest. No one rises to speak on his behalf. Peter lingers outside in the courtyard, but when asked if he is one of the disciples of Jesus, he denies it. He will not admit to having any relationship with Jesus. Then Jesus stands alone before Pilate, and the crowd shouts with one voice, Crucify him! Jesus is condemned, and he carries the cross by himself. The soldiers nail Jesus to the cross, imposing on him a terribly painful and final form of isolation. Jesus is now unable to move. He's hung there to die. These past weeks, we all have had our own experiences of isolation. 
staying at home, sheltering in place, and social distancing have changed the pattern of our daily lives. We miss all the usual social interaction that we had taken for granted up until now. This time is much harder for those who live alone and those who are confined to nursing homes. It's hardest of all for those who are hospitalized, unable to be visited by those who love them. Sadly, some have died alone, unaccompanied in their final hours. This pandemic has brought upon us unwelcome solitude and loneliness. Many are feeling the stress and the strain of isolation. There is an element in John's passion narrative that is unique, a piece of the story to which I had never given much thought. In John's telling, Jesus is not utterly alone at the end. As he hangs on the cross in agony, at the foot of the cross, there's a small group of family and friends. Gathered there are his mother, his aunt, Mary, the wife of Clopas, Mary Magdalene, and the disciple John. There is great pathos in this scene, a mother watching her own son suffer and die. In Franco Zeffirelli's film, Jesus of Nazareth, the portrayal of this scene is truly heartbreaking. The only thing that would have been worse for Mary than watching Jesus die would have been not being there. Knowing that he was dying alone, surrounded only by executioners, scoffers, despisers, and strangers. Yet in that awful and painful moment, Jesus was not alone. There was a small community gathered there at the foot of the cross. Jesus had a unique and personal mission. No one else could do what Jesus came to accomplish. Yet Jesus did not fulfill his mission alone. Throughout his ministry, Jesus lived and worked in community, surrounded by his 12 disciples and many faithful followers. His mission was personal, but it was not private. Earlier, Jesus had said this, I know my own and my own know me. The shepherd knows his sheep by name, and they know and they trust his voice. Jesus said that he came so that we may have life and have it abundantly. And he demonstrates that abundant life is life lived together in trust and love. Life lived in holy community. Even in his dying agony, Jesus shows his care for the community of his followers. Seeing the five who are gathered at the cross, he instructs his mother to think of John as his son and for John to consider Mary to be his mother. Jesus wants no one to be left alone. And we are assured that John followed through, taking Mary into his home, into his family from that day forward. The authorities had imagined that by killing Jesus, they would quickly put an end to the movement that Jesus had inspired. Kill the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. That is what they intended. But the crucifixion could not stop Christ's compassion. At the very end, as he draws his final tortured breath, Jesus looks to the needs of those that he loves. And as he had said, his life is not taken from him. Jesus freely lays down his life. The shepherd gives his life for the sake of the sheep. Remember how at the Last Supper, Jesus had prayed that his followers might be together as one, even as he and his Father are one. His dying instruction was for those he loved to care for one another. God said at the very beginning, at the creation, that it is not good for man to be alone. You and I are made for community. Most of us have come to a fresh appreciation of this very fundamental truth. These days we do feel the pain of separation. We long for the warmth of fellowship and community. We miss being able to come together with friends and extended family. There will be no large gatherings this year for Easter dinner. And of course we long to join with one another for worship and holy communion in this holy and special place. The good news, though, is that we are not alone. For a time, we may be separated, but we are not, we cannot be scattered. We are still the family of God, bound together by the love of Jesus Christ. 
Christ calls us to care for one another, and so we will. The worst that men can do was no match for the goodness of God, God's gracious mercy and love in Jesus Christ. The crucifixion was intended to put an end to that fledgling Christian community. Instead, it was a beginning. Shortly before his arrest, Jesus had indicated the kind of death he was to die. He said, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. And so he has. At the cross, we stand together as one people, one family of faith, of hope, and of love. Thanks be to God. Let us pray, brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church of God throughout the world, that God, the Almighty Father, guide it and gather it together so that we may worship him in peace and tranquility. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. Guide the work of the church, help it to persevere in faith, proclaim your name, and bring salvation to people everywhere. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for our bishops, Elizabeth and Yehio, for all pastors and other ministers, for all the servants of the church, and for all the people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our pastors and our leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church. And help each of us to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let's pray for all our brothers and sisters who share our faith in Jesus Christ, that God may gather us and keep us together in one church, all those who know Christ as Lord. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church its unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. We are all consecrated to you by our baptism. Make us one in the fullness of faith and keep us one in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for the Jewish people, the first to hear the word of God, that they may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and his posterity. Hear the prayers of your church that the people you first made your own may arrive with us at the fullness of redemption. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in Christ, that the light of the Holy Spirit may show them the way of salvation. Almighty and eternal God, enable those who do not acknowledge Christ to receive the truth of the gospel. Help us, your people, to grow in love for one another to grasp more fully the mystery of your Godhead, and so to become more perfect witnesses of your love in the sight of all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who do not believe in God, that they may find him who is the author and goal of our existence. Almighty and eternal God, you created humanity so that all might long to know you and have peace in you. Grant that in spite of the hurtful things that stand in their way, they may all recognize in the lives of Christians the tokens of your love and mercy and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God and Father of us all. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for those who serve in public office that God may guide their minds and hearts so that all of us may live in true peace and freedom. Almighty and eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, watch over those in authority so that people everywhere may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Let us pray that God, the Almighty and Merciful Father, may heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty, and rid the world of falsehood, hunger, and disease. 
almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord would have us ask. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Behold the life-giving cross on which was hung the salvation of the whole world. Thanks be to God. 